Hi there, um, Angst here. I'm going to be doing another schizoid quest or interview. I just like to call them quests because it's funny, especially since um, this quest is usually pretty not so fun for most of us, um, this schizoid quest. But um, today I'm here with Tay. Is Tay fine? Yeah, Tay's Tay, good. Tay's, Tay's um. good. I'm here with Tay, <laughs> and Tay um, is going to answer a few questions. And we're going to get into the nitty gritty of a couple of things, whatever they're comfortable with, obviously. And um, go ahead and Tay and just tell them a little bit about yourself, some basics. Uh, I know that's kind of hard for Zoe to do, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> like, where are you from? How old you are? Um, and kind of what you do, sort of whatever you feel like, you know, saying. Um, all right. Well, uh, I'm Tay. This is my epic voice reveal, and uh, I'm 24 years old in Miami, the worst place to be for a Zoid, um, and I do accounting work on a computer at home, so I don't have to talk to that many people, which is nice. Uh, those were the three things you asked. Is there anything? I don't care. Like, like is there anything you? <laughs> I don't. Is there anything you want that you care to mention about yourself that you think would be relevant contextually to the questions that I'm going to be um, asking? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm going to ask you questions oh. about your thoughts. So, like, is there anything contextual-wise that like you think would be yeah. of of, of so, value to mention? Contextually, I'm diagnosed with schizoid personality disorder, mm -hmm. uh, dysthymia with anxious distress, and panic disorder. Uh, that's at the moment. I don't know if it'll change when I switch therapists again eventually. Uh, they tend to just go with whatever they like. So, this, uh, Can you explain the dysthymia a little bit? Yeah, so um, because I have persistent depressive disorder, um, I'm basically always at kind of a zero in emotion, and then every once in a while I'll uh, dip into what's called double depression, uh, which is... Is it like double just, jeopardy? Yeah, it's just as awesome as it sounds. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah, I, I think I have that too, whatever that is. <laughs> yeah, if you've, been, uh, if you've been depressed for, I think for adults it's two years or more, uh, you automatically pretty much qualify for persistent what, what, what depression. What if it's like... Um, what if it's like fifteen years? Yeah, yeah. You you've you've checked off the box, dude. You are good to go. Hell yeah. I'm cool yeah. like you now. Yeah. <laughs> All right, anything else? Um not really. I just I I'm having a hard time thinking of stuff that's important. So <laughs> mm, a schizoid that can't think of things that are important to them. Wow. Big big big, yeah. big, big surprise, right? Right, I'm I'm so unique. Mm, hell unique. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm interviewing you because of how unique you are. Yeah, yeah. Damn. Definitely not because I just signed up. No, yeah. not at all. No, okay. not at all. Okay, so let's start with the first question. And these questions have been pretty much the same for everyone I've talked to and interviewed. And um, and I just want to mention ahead of time. The goal is sort of to get a better kind of qualitative uh, bit of information about what schizoid adaptations <clears throat> look like, feel like, <clears throat> are experienced as, and so on and so forth. So that's why I generally okay. specifically like to um, talk to more diagnosed schizoids and things like that. But in any case, um, number one, would you describe yourself as a floating head? Do you prefer concepts over objects? I don't know if I describe myself as a floating head, maybe more like a floating body. I tend to feel more like I'm in almost outer space all the time. So I honestly like the idea of tethering myself to objects to try and ground myself um but i think habitually i tend to gravitate more towards concepts could you describe that a little bit like could you give an I, example of when you do this or how you do it 
I can try. Yeah, you can so... definitely try. That's all, you can, that's all okay. I can ask. That's all I can ask for. Um, okay, so let's say it's 3 a.m. And uh, you're in your room all alone. It's quiet. You close your eyes. Okay. And suddenly you're you're underwater. You've, you're down in the Mariana Trench, dude. Um, you're floating. Okay. It feels like you're not you're not where you're supposed to be even though you feel comfortable there you know that you don't belong there um so what i tend to do is i'll instinctively try to reach for a book or maybe a game or sometimes i'll just even like a pillow anything physical to try and remind myself that like i'm i'm in this dimension and not just Floating nowhere. Mm -hmm. What does that floating yeah. feel like? Um, it it it's really similar to being underwater. Um, have you ever gone underneath the pool and just released all of the air out of your lungs, and you're just kind of at the bottom? No, but I can't imagine. Uh, yeah, it's like that, but the pressure is more intense. It's like the air itself is kind of suffocating you, but in a comfy way. Would you describe it as a, like a derealization type feeling? Yeah, it, it's probably that. Like, the, is it is it disconnect from you and your environment, or you from your body? Both, to be honest. Okay, it's so. this, yeah, it's this really hard yeah. to describe feeling. So you disassociate from the body as well as you realize from your environment at that. Okay. I was just curious. Yeah. Thanks. Um, okay. Yeah. So would you describe yourself as a minimalist who performs only the most crucial activities before returning to your thoughts? I don't want to say yes, but the answer is yes. Uh, Why don't I'm you want to definitely... say yes? Because <laughs> I feel like... Um... I guess I just habitually feel like I should be doing more than I am, but I always just do the bare minimum and then go, all right, uh, that's good enough for me. See you later. And, and only to return back to your thoughts or whatever you are preoccupied yeah. with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, you're b back in your headspace is when you're, is when you're most comfortable, I'm guessing. Yeah. When I'm by myself is, exactly when i'm most comfortable is your immediate environment somewhat ne neglected like in terms of cleanliness yes like uh are you like you know do you have dishes and wash stuff everywhere like do you neglect your your conditions because mm. of not because like i'm not saying oh you're lazy you know uh, i'm asking just descriptively are your ne conditions neglected yeah, I think it depends on the day of the week. If it's a work day, um, my environment is completely neglected. I'm just focusing 100% on work and then relaxation right after. Um, and then on Sundays specifically, uh, that's my clean everything day. And I just designate every Sunday to um, putting myself back in a healthy environment. What, um, curious to uh, yeah. go further. Um, what would you say is more energy draining? The Sundays in which you clean the house or the days in which you work? Definitely the days I work. Okay. So, so the cleaning yeah. of the house isn't so bad on Sundays. Yeah, it's not that bad. Um, I think it's because I'm not using mental energy to clean. Um, whereas with work, it's almost all mental energy. So. Got it. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, do you oscillate between meaning or a sense of meaning and despair? Or do you feel constantly empty or disassociated? Um, definitely empty and disassociated. I don't really put much emphasis on meaning and I try not to delve into despair. So yeah, pretty much always empty. Always empty. So when, uh, when you say you don't, you try not to, um, put emphasis you said on meaning or what did you say yeah um, um does that mean you just do do avoid thoughts uh regarding meaning or is it because you find it to be unimportant 
I find it to be unimportant. Um, regardless of whether I know the meaning or not, I'm still stuck here. So, <laughs> so stuck. I like that. Okay. Um, do important thoughts slip out of the sides of your mental workspace? Do you feel impulsive or dysregulated? I think if it's important to me, I won't forget it. But if it's important to someone else, there's a good chance it'll slip out of my mental space, you said? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like your works, but basically, you, you, do you have trouble keeping track of things that you're supposed to accomplish or do uh, and um, are more likely to just do whatever it is that you feel like doing at any given moment? That, that's kind of what. But oh, you said I see it what varies. you mean. You said it varies? Yeah. Um, so I get. Um, I think they call it brain fog, where um, every once in a while you kind of, your memory gets a little hazy. Mm -hmm. So I tend to have lists to keep track of what I need to do. Mm -hmm. um, if I don't have that list, then it's a brain fog day. Uh, chances are I'm not going to get anything done. What's interesting is uh, you say brain fog. Does the brain fog affect your ability to do things that you do that aren't? outside of the realm of what would slip out of your mind? Like, in other words, um, let's just say it's more internal world sort of stuff. Like, does your brain fog affect that, or does it only affect the kind of more uh, practical things you're supposed to do that day or productive, quote-unquote? That's actually a really good question. I never realized it before, but it does affect my fantasy world, too. It's basically like that entire day is uh, a blank. It's blinked out. Okay. Do, yeah. you, do you swap between experiencing individuals, objects, or concepts as all good or all bad? Not asking about the intensity or the badness or goodness, but is it you, do, you, do you swap between it, it's all this and all that, not gray areas? I think my first reaction is that, mm -hmm. uh, to view something as all good and all bad, and then my second reaction is always to kind of give uh, almost like benefit of the doubt or a devil's advocate sense where, like, for example, um, if you're more conservative leaning, I, my immediate thought is always a little bit, oh, you're like, I'm immediately assuming that you're A, B, C, D. Um, and then my second reaction is, well, no, that's probably not true. Let me give them benefit of the doubt. So, yeah. Okay, so you're saying that there are your the swapping sometimes happens initially, like a knee jerk reaction. Um, yeah, the knee jerk reaction is uh, either an all good, all bad, and then like the afterthought is let me look at the gray areas. Okay. Are you are the people around you usually confident? or incompetent? How do you perceive them? People around you? Um, or humans that you interact with? Do you perceive them as generally incompetent or competent? I think they're all competent in their own things. There's definitely things they're incompetent in, but uh, I'm not competent in those either, so I can't say anything about it, you know? So it's relative no one's to the competent. individual and the context. Yeah, no one's competent at everything. Okay. Are, are you usually competent or incompetent? <laughs> uh, I'm competent at being incompetent, Eggs. That's my uh, main competency. I've heard that before. What do you mean by that? <laughs> uh, the only thing I, you know, find competent in myself is that uh, I can recognize there's a bunch of things I don't fucking know so <laughs> um that's what i mean when i say i'm only competent at being incompetent i just don't care to know someone else so it's a, a disinterest in becoming competent in other things uh necessarily yeah. so you, yeah, you're not like exactly. driven to become competent at this or that uh is there yeah. anything that you're driven to be competent at mm. Like that you feel, I want to be good at this thing, or that thing. 
for whatever the reason it doesn't have to be because like you think it's so special whatever reason it is that you feel you need you should be confident in this or that i guess just like all of the con all of the basic aspects of autonomy you know living alone driving alone um being able to do things completely on your own is something that i really want to be extremely competent in so, so self-sufficiency uh, yeah exactly yeah, but that, that's what's interesting that's what's interesting is that being self-sufficient requires a certain degree of competence in general yeah that's a good point right i mean i mean unless you think otherwise but i'm just saying I, no, I you're right. Um, there's there's too many people that are incompetent at being self sufficient. So I guess I didn't consider that as a subject to be competent in. But you're completely right. No, so I guess maybe the better question is: Do you think most people are self sufficient or not? Oh no, God no. <laughs> <laughs> like I I genuinely pity people sometimes. Okay. Good, good. Um, that's uh, that's that's kind of like that's why I dig a little bit further because sometimes the way the questions that I ask might not kind of be perceived in the way that is intended, and so I like to ask like follow ups like that to kind of so 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 that kind of that kind of makes a difference there, right? To perceive yeah. other people as not being self sufficient is another way of perceiving people as not being very confident, right? Yeah. Um, does being instructed, corrected or informed by those closest to you bring sensations of safety or sensations of discomfort? Uh, discomfort. Don't tell me what to do and how to do it. Could you elaborate on that further? Why? And, uh, and examples in which maybe something like that occurred and what you felt. So I don't know if this completely applies to the question but uh my father has um kind of very peculiar ways about doing things uh like for example when he makes coffee in the morning mm -hmm. he has to put the filter in a specific way he has to put a very specific amount of coffee um and he has to put exactly this amount of water and it doesn't matter how many people he's serving, he just needs that exact amount. And if I happen to get to the coffee machine first, I have to do it that way. Otherwise, he gets very upset. And um, I think that's ridiculous. Although I recognize that it comforts him, um, at the same time, I, I, can't, I can't give a damn, you know? Do you, do you ever intentionally do it wrong? No, I just do it the way I want to. Okay. And so the hope is that they just won't notice at that time? So yes. You don't have to deal with exactly. It. The hope is that he doesn't notice. And if he does notice, then I just go, oopsie daisies, I forgot, sorry. And then I live my life. So it's, that's interesting only because does that, does that kind of um, approach extend to a lot of what you do? Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, I have moments where my boss will tell me, um, hey, I want you to do it this specific way. And I go, okie dokie, um, I'll do it my way. And then she'll go, I mean, I, I like the way you did it, but why didn't you do it my way? And I go, I thought this was your way. Oopsie. Hmm. Interesting. I like that. Okay. It so... might be manipulative, but like, whatever. <laughs> I mean, no one. I mean, you're getting it done, right? No one's getting hurt. You're getting it done. Yeah, exactly. I'm doing the task. I'm just doing it in no, the way that I just. I, I just find it interesting. I just find it interesting because I see that that kind of varies a little bit between Zoid to Zoid too. Because like some of them um, will actively do it the way they're in, told to do it to avoid any kind of possibility of conflict or uh, any possibility of being questioned um and mm. in order to avoid that situation they generally will do it as instructed but um but you do the opposite but what, what yeah. i find what I, what I find funny about that like you, you're kind of uh what's the word um 
you're kind of, you're a little bit con not, I don't think you're intentionally contrarian. It's more like because if the person tells you to do a certain way and you agree with that way, you'll do it that way. Yes. Yeah, I won't lie outright. I'll no, but I'm saying if you agree with the way they instructed, will you do it their yeah. way or will you just intentionally not do it their way because it's the way they said to do it? Oh, no. If the, if the yeah. way they said it is to me correct, then of course I'll do it that way. Um, I'm not yeah. intentionally, you know. Yeah, you're not just being a contrarian. Fucking shit yeah. up. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Can you feel the emotions of others, or do you experience them as obstacles or puppets? Can I feel the emotions of others? Yeah, like, like a, more like, uh, well, we're talking more like affective empathy. Not so much the cognitive stuff. More like, uh, do you feel like the, 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 if someone is sad, do you feel that they're sad? Like, do you feel the sadness with them or the happiness oh. with them? Or the anger with them. Or... Yeah, I I can understand and I can kind of falsify my behavior mm -hmm. to work with whatever they're feeling, but um, internally, n no, I don't really understand why they feel the way they do. Do you, and and that's to to further that question is do you, so then do you perceive their feelings as obstacles or things puppets? In other words, things that are just controlling them. Um, obstacles to you or things that you perceive as obstacles to them or things that control them i think it's an obstacle to them because they're kind of completely controlled by their emotions rather than logic and um it's just kind of pitiful to me sometimes like you hear all these stories about um people going off the deep end because their high school sweetheart doesn't love them back and i just i I, I don't get it, man. I can't, can't connect with that. It's pitiful. Okay. Uh, is empathizing easier with individuals, fictional characters, or groups of people? Mm, probably individuals, just because, you know, when you're in a group of people, you're kind of just copying what everyone else is doing, at least in my situation. Um, I'm not really actively working to understand the other person i'm just copying whatever the group is saying mm -hmm. um but if it's an individual i'm i have a better grasp of who they are because i'm working harder to understand their mentality and i guess i guess the same goes for fictional characters because at the end of the day a fictional character is just written by an individual anyway so which one would you say is easier or have you ever emotionally connected to in any capacity another person or fictional characters written by another person? Um, I don't know. I don't think I've ever emotionally connected to any of them. I can just understand why they feel that way. Got it. Do yeah. you more often share others' pain or enjoy it? it depends on how serious the pain is if it's a if it's like a genuine uh i i'm torn into pieces type of pain um i i do feel like that clench in my in my chest but if it's like a casual pain like you know um their pencil lead keeps breaking and uh or you know they crashed into a tree that they swore wasn't there i'll i'll fucking giggle at them i don't care you what uh i'll giggle at them i think it's oh, funny yeah. just a little bit just a little bit you know all right do you more often share others joy or do you lament it in other words like kind of like it makes you sad or you resent seeing their joy no or do you, or i like do you seeing share people it? happy yeah. I don't share it, but it, it's um, it, it doesn't upset me to see people happy. I think it's, I think it's nice that they can feel like that. You know, I don't know how to explain it right. No, it's it's that's perfectly fine. Though. Good. Is empathizing with yourself easier via your individual struggles or through art, philosophy, politics, etc.? Um, 
how do you definitely yeah, go ahead sorry no no i'm gonna need you to rephrase that question because okay. i i'm having so a like, hard time the way you connect with yourself or aspects of your identity of self is it through other mediums like art philosophy politics everything else you know whatever subjects are kind of almost like intellectually or you know otherwise or do you connect to yourself via the experiences you've had in your life um definitely the experiences i've had i try to you know express myself through my art but i always feel like it's not it's it's not enough you know like the art that i do doesn't fully express the feeling that i have so um definitely personal experiences make feel more than artwork does are you more of a subject who deserves happiness an obstacle slash puppet or a malevolent entity which must be defeated how do you perceive yourself <laughs> uh hmm. i guess i view my body as a puppet because i really do feel like um there's not a lot of choice in the things that I do. I just do them. Um, even if I give myself the illusion of choice, I, I don't necessarily feel like it's real. But in terms of, you know, my mentality, yeah, I'd, I'd say I'm a little bit of a malevolent entity. I would. <laughs> I, I think it's... yourself as a bad, <laughs> scary thing that you need to keep in check? Well, yeah, defeat. I'm the big bad... I'm a big bad boogeyman, dude, and I'm just controlling this meat vehicle. Mm, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, are you isolated? If so, how? Um, I don't think I'd consider myself isolated just because I don't have the opportunity to be. Um, where I live is pretty expensive, mm -hmm. so I'm stuck living with um, other humans and um, yeah it's it's that simple if I had the option of being isolated I'd I'd take it in a heartbeat do you think you would have a detrimental effect on you though after a, maybe an extended period you know I wonder about that sometimes um, I don't really have an answer because I've never been able so to you have an opportunity for like pure isolation for exactly extended yeah if time. i don't know i i feel right now it would be it would be beneficial mm -hmm. but maybe that's not realistic at the same time got it uh do you desire relationships uh, and not necessarily a romantic one it, it could be friendships do you desire them if not why i don't um and I don't mean it in like a I'll actively reject a friendship. I just mean it as I don't seek out relationships on my own. They come to me and I let them go when they want to go. Gotcha. Okay. Do you feel like there is a seemingly impenetrable communication barrier or differences in values preventing others from relating to you? As in, like, there is a capacity, technically speaking, for someone to connect to you, but there's something that just makes it impen almost an impenetrable communication barrier. Yeah, I'd say so. I don't know if people, this, I don't mean to sound exclusionist or whatever you want to call it, but I really do think that if someone doesn't have the mentality of um, someone with schizoid personality disorder, they're going to have a pretty hard time understanding why we act the way that we act, I guess. So that in itself is a pretty big barrier. Cool. I mean, yeah, to say the least. And so did, yeah. have, you, have you ever had situations in which, like, maybe you felt like, you almost did, or you, you, even if you say you falsified the thought, but like that you, you thought you were about to, or you thought you something, you were on to the possibility. And then uh, this communication barrier settles back in and just reminds you that 
uh, that that disconnect is is somehow feels uh, um, in a, uh, inevitable or it's going to occur again. So you're discouraged from uh, continuing down that route. When I was younger, yeah, I'd say so. Um, just because the first time that um, like someone confesses to you or the first time um, someone calls you their best friend or, you know, all of those tiny little firsts, you're always going to get like, I mean, um, maybe it's because I have a panic disorder. I don't know. But uh, I always get that like anxious heart pumping, like, is this what I'm supposed to do? What am I supposed to say type of thing? Mm -hmm. um, so I've had moments where, you know, I'll say something in the heat of the moment and then I go, I didn't fucking feel like that. Why did I say it like that? Um, and yeah, you learn from that first incident and then you don't do it again. Okay. What can uh, potential friends or partners, even if they feel like impossible to achieve because of a variety of reasons, but let's just, let's just, let's talk hypothetically. Okay. What could potential mm -hmm. friends or partners change about their behavior or expectations to help you feel more comfortable pursuing the relationship? This is going to sound really counterintuitive, and I wholeheartedly recognize that. Um, I feel I feel like it would work if they just left me the fuck alone. Um, and again, counterintuitive, but like, um, if they're in some kind of position where they're never encroaching on my space or taking up time that I don't feel I have to give, um, I'm going to feel closer to you, I guess. Can you elaborate on that a little bit further? I can try. <laughs> um... Oh, okay. So usually when you're in a relationship, you're expected to communicate with each other on a certain basis, like maybe once a day, twice a day, 50 times a day, whatever. Um, if there was someone who was okay with communicating on a once a week basis or a okay, once every okay. other week basis. So if you, you, know, met, if you had a friend and distance. they were like never... Uh, never had expectation talk and just they want to speak to you or impose yes. that that would be useful that would be awesome um if they contacted me once every blue moon and you know needed some kind of emotional support or whatever i'm what i'm if, totally okay with that what if what if um, um because you have this friend or this person that doesn't apply these expectations uh manifest right what would you mm -hmm. do if say you started developing a want to contact them i'd probably ask them if they were okay with it just because i know if they started feeling that way i'd want them to reach out to me about it and let me know beforehand that they want to talk more interesting the reason i ask too is i often think about like say 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 you stumble across this person right but didn't know mm -hmm. it at some point in your life. And I think about this possibility for Zoids is that what if this person would have been that person that understood that, but because we never actually told them anything, they never even had the opportunity, and we lived only under the assumption that they never would. Yeah. Um, I but, mean, if they're sneaking around, if, if, the, if the person for me is just sneaking around and uh, doesn't recognize um like the connection that i have with them and vice versa uh i think that's just how it was meant to be i don't think well, well, that what i mean if that person is say actively say they're they're trying to hit you up more often than you'd like right okay uh-huh if you approach it with hey well i'm just going to stop talking to you now because you're the kind of person that likes to hit me up a lot instead of saying hey i don't like to be hit up a lot I feel like it removes oh. the opportunity for that other person to even display the possibility of being understanding of that situation. 
And uh, yeah, it's just so, it's just a thought. It's just a thought popping no, right now. No, well, I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, maybe I was wording myself incorrectly, but um, typically with the people I tend to keep a connection with, mm -hmm. or the people I communicate with on, you know, however long of a basis, whether it's monthly or semi-annually, whatever, they're all fully aware that I'm I'm not the type to communicate well. I'm never um like skirting around that fact mm -hmm. um anyone who continues to keep in touch with me um they'll they'll know because i tell them up front that i don't like texting i don't like calling um if you need me then that's one thing but if it's just this unimportant thing i'm probably not going to text back and the people that stay are okay with it So that brings to the one of the last actual question question is what would the ideal relationship look like so you kind of partially described that um yeah so if we're talking mm. uh, i guess quote unquote a partner what would that ideal look like mm. i'm trying to think of it realistically because this isn't something that i tend to think about um i guess maybe if they have like a job where they're not near me like i guess like, a, like pilot a trucker or trucker, or a trucker? I don't know. A trucker yeah an great. astronaut you know what an astronaut i'll take an astronaut, astronaut. He would date an astronaut. <laughs> yeah he's all the way up there what's he gonna do about it um <laughs> but so yeah cool. um <laughs> just stupid shit like that yeah um if if they're in a position where they can be as far away from me as reasonably acceptable, that's good. I just find it know. fascinating because of how, how much that tells uh, could tell uh, someone listening about yourself that the very <laughs> like the closer someone is to you, the further away you want them to be. Uh, yeah. Think, uh, oh, you know what it's like. Have you you know when you try to put. Like, a north magnet and a north magnet together and they just fucking they're it's that the closer you get the more i'm gonna like yeet out the other way you just want to eat, eat them away somewhere else yeah so funny yeah get out of my bubble you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's other people closer to their bubble that don't that you're indifferent to which is kind of funny to think about like you would yeah them if they keep away. <laughs> yeah, if they keep like a ten foot distance, that's where I'm most comfortable. Oh, okay. Just yell at me from across the yard, and we'll be fine. Okay, so this is the last yeah. kind of section. Um, I want to talk about the nature of your inner landscape, fantasy life, etc. Your you know perception of reality internally and against your external world. Like, could you tell us a little bit about what that looks like? What you're willing to share about what that looks like? Most of my fantasies tend to lean more towards, I guess, like a morbid side, just because I find, I, I just find like my own death to be a really comforting thought. <laughs> um, I'm not actively, you know, suicidal or anything. It's just um, the idea of not being is really, really comforting to me. So you've romanticized oh, the concept of death in your fantasies. Yeah, specifically my death. Like, I'm, sometimes I'll fantasize about other people's death, but only if it benefits me and I'm feeling mean that day. Um, <laughs> but, uh, see, most people would not expect someone with uh, my voice to say shit like that. Um, and I wouldn't say shit like that if you weren't I don't find it surprising so, at all, so... Awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah, a lot of my fantasies tend to center around that. Um, sometimes they'll center around more nature aspects, like forests and rivers and um, just really quiet spaces where all you can hear is, you know, birds and wind and nothing man-made. Uh, and yeah, 
I'm trying to think of any other really common fantasies that I'll have. How do your inner fantasies or your inner perceptions um, translate into the external world, if at all? Mm. Every once in a while, um, I like to go to this dog park that's near my house. Um, and the only reason I go is because it's massive um, to the point that you really can't see that many other people. And uh, it's so, it's so beautiful. It's really one of those places where it's probably the most realistic version of my fantasy that I've been able to access so far. So sometimes I'll go there and then I have the physical aspect of being in nature versus the mental aspect of whatever I feel like fantasizing about. So it's like fantasize places further like, when you're in there. Yeah, exactly. It Since I sense. don't have to compensate for the, the nature part, if I'm in nature already, I can, you know, expand my fantasy into other things. And uh, what kind of narratives do you build in those fantasies? Like, um, what are the what are the what are the common storylines or ideas or concepts that are being experimented with? Tropes, maybe cliches, even characters, whatever. <laughs> uh, I really like. I, what was it? You said the word in a stream the other day, and I'm trying to remember. Bittersweet. Mm -hmm. That's what it was. I like bittersweet uh, tragedies, you know, where, um, let's say in my fantasy, I did care enough about someone that I would cry if they died tomorrow. I'll try to fantasize that feeling just so I can feel close to something, even though it's not realistic of me. Um, I'll try to fantasize about, um, maybe having magic every once in a while. If I'm feeling spiffy that day, angst, you know, <laughs> sure. I'll... No, I get it. I yeah, get it. it just depends extra, on the day. Extra spicy. Yeah. I want to throw in some, some, uh, Elder Scrolls yeah. spells, spells in there or whatever. Yes. If I'm feeling, if I'm feeling a little bit, <laughs> you like, know. What superpower do I want today? Exactly. And then other days I'll just be like, so who's died this morning? Um Okay, we'll make it this random person who and apparently I loved I, for forty years. Yeah, yeah. That's so funny. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I just I just love that because like a lot of Zoids they base create narratives in their mind in an attempt to feel emotions they can't outwardly feel in their IRL very well. So um or establish connections uh that and, and so that's what's so that's what's so interesting to me is that that desperate yearning uh for something to feel real something to feel like something um all that proves to me is that the zoid is um just as human as anyone else it's just uh there's certain barriers of communication and issues uh, that I've established, well, I've talked about um, a lot elsewhere, but uh, I, I just find that interesting. I find that part fascinating. And it, 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 that kind of stuff makes both a, a someone with a schizoid adaptation is uncomfortable, uh, but at the same time, they gravitate toward it. Like, for example, uh, and I don't mean to, like, I just I just think it's, it's good for the, the conversation, about, and I don't mean to call you out, Tay, but uh, you do it. Do it. I call you out. Okay, I'm gonna call you. Yeah. Out. <laughs> you. You are on ever almost every single stream I do. Mhm. Mm you actively participate and talk, and communicate with some of the other people on there, and myself. Uh, and you're going there out of your own volition. Yes. Yes, I am. Uh, because I have absolutely no power over your ability to show up or not. Zero. Well, uh, I don't know. I don't. <laughs> I don't, know. I don't. And <laughs> it's, um, and, uh, you know, maybe it's because it's a parasocial sort of dynamic that's occurring there, uh, since there's, like, a big barrier 
um, between myself or yourself uh, and other people on there. Um, the internet, as well as distance and location and everything else, time, space, all that. But I, one thing I've always kind of noticed, especially when it comes to Zoids, is that there tends to be this contradiction, right? And I don't see this contradiction mm -hmm. as like hypocritical or a judgment or anything like that. I see it as something kind of uh, like, like I said before, like you mentioned that, uh, and I think about it, it's something very bittersweet about it. Mm -hmm. um, and it, that's that regardless of the claims that are often made by some more of these adaptations, their actions don't always prove that. Um, their actions oftentimes run contrary to that. And what's interesting, too, is that when the discovery is made by the person doing it, it often leads them to, quote unquote, zoid out. Uh, because they realize that there's a contradiction. So it causes a sort of weird kind of cognitive dissonance that can make somebody uh, with these sort of adaptations kind of uncomfortable. Does that make sense? I, yeah, I actually have a story that fits that exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right. You're completely right in saying that the majority of the reason I feel so comfortable in the streams is because there's that parasocial disconnect. Um, if you were having like weekly group meetups down the street, I'm not coming. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but what because if we just kidnap behind... you, though? Okay, if you've kidnapped me, I guess I'll just start singing church chimes until you bring me back. I don't know. I might like those. Um, you don't know. I'll just sing it in this really annoying tone. Okay. I can I can make my voice pretty annoying. Okay, don't let's you, not do that. Let's not do fret. that now. Okay, but anyway, you were saying so parasocial disconnect. Yeah, I think because you're behind the screen, um, I don't feel like I'm, I don't, I don't mean this in any negative way. I don't feel like I don't I'm care. talking to a real human being, you That's know? Cool. I, feel I don't, like I don't think I am a real human being nothing. half the time, so it's okay. <laughs> I think that's the whole thing with Zoids, yeah, where like you're kind of, um, even when you're talking to someone from across the screen, there's like this feeling of, um, almost like you're imagining the person you want to be talking to mm -hmm. behind the screen, right? Because you don't know everything about the person you're talking to. So you can kind of fill the blanks with what you need to fill. But when they're right in front of you, you have to acknowledge that that's like a whole other human being over there. And uh, that's a little bit too much for me. So I'm in a, terms a, of like... I, this, this is just experimental, but I'm just going to like throw it out there. Okay? Are you listening? <laughs> I am listening. What if, what if, what if, right? There's human beings out there that when they were in front of you and you saw them as a whole human being, you actually were comfortable with. <gasps> Angst. You're speaking, you're speaking hearsay. I don't know. What kind of blasphemy is this? Well, that's, that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. That's kind of what I'm trying to help Zoids with. That, that, that possibility exists because... Um, there mm. are other human beings that I don't know that experience sounds like a the same experience to me. the same experience that you experience with other people in general. They also have that same experience, and then those people then do not have that experience with each other as much. That's all I'm saying. Wait, okay, are you trying to say that other human beings also feel? weird around other human beings well not just weird That's completely impossible. alien uh and they feel alien for the same reasons or similar reasons which could then allow those people to relate to each other and be comfortable around each other as whole human beings it's pretty crazy pretty crazy although i agree logically with what you're saying i'm gonna call it blasphemy because emotionally i don't like it i know I, of course not why would you like it it's horrible I didn't. yeah I it's told, terrible it's terrible terrible you know but you're that's, speaking war crimes but that, these that, are war crimes these are war crimes that's what's so funny about it is uh what i find most interesting about that is that the the zoid tends to be very rational and logical and all this stuff until it, it hits that wall and then all of yeah. a sudden all that goes right out the goddamn door and they turn <laughs> into 
the same irrational, emotionally driven human beings that they often claim uh, are, are terrible. Exactly. exactly. Okay, well, um, I think as far as this interview goes, um, I think I got a lot of cool and interesting answers from you. And is there anything uh, you would like to say before it's totally ended uh, about your experiences with the channel, the server? This is basically the portion where you could say I'm awesome but or say I'm stupid. Yeah, you want me to chill for you? I can no, chill not, for you. No, don't chill. Don't chill. Just say <laughs> your feelings regarding the project. I don't need you to shill. Like, I just need you to say what you think. Uh, what, you know, what's lacking and what is good and so on and so forth. You know, just, some, just whatever your thoughts are on the matter. If any. If none, then it's okay. I, I really like this project. Um, I don't have the, cap the capability to do what you're doing. So I really want to see you uh, prosper in it, if that makes any sense just because I feel like it is really beneficial for other Zoids to hear different aspects of other people that think the same way and so that they know they're not totally alone in this world or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think it's really good for you to give people a space to talk about stuff like this. It's not very common. And I think, person listening, you should also support it. Um, does that count as a half show? Yeah, that's fine. All right. Woo! That was fine enough to not make me uncomfortable, so good job. Thanks to anybody listening to this, um, and thank you uh, if you do want to support the project. Patreon, see, this is where I show. Is, um, <laughs> the PayPal's there. I'll take Bitcoin or crypto if you don't like, you know, bank-related currency or whatever. Uh, I don't care. I'll take whatever you can give me, and I'll dedicate it to uh, making this more of a living. Uh, you can also it. give him your potential firstborn if you really want to. I don't want that. Why would no, I want he'll that? take it. I don't want that. I think he'll take it. Okay, he'll take well, I'll, I'll take it and sell it on the black market for more money. So, all right. So, in any case. <laughs> 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 all right, then. Uh, thanks a lot for listening. Zoid out.